and he was casting out evil spirits. He was healing people. I mean, it was just a moving party around Jesus. But then as we turn the page from chapter four to chapter five, Jesus paused. He goes over to a hillside and he begins to teach the people. It's almost as if, as we've been saying, it's, it's almost as if he said, yeah, I've been healing you on the outside. I got a lot more of that to do. I want to take a moment and I want to heal you on the inside, the parts that nobody else can see. And what he did over the course of season two is he took this upside down world and he turned it right side up again and really started to teach us that the foundation of the kingdom, the kingdom of God is an unshakable joy that slowly grows. Somebody say slowly, slowly grows from the bottom up. And so we're never going to fully arrive because God's always got more freedom for us. He's always got more he wants to do in our life. And as he continues that journey, we're just growing in that unshakable joy day after day. And it's an amazing journey that he wants to be part of. But then there was a cliffhanger at the end of season two, because the Bible said that Jesus looked up at all these different cities and areas. And he said, man, it looks like a harvest field that's ripe and ready to go but there's not enough people yet on the team to do something about it, but we're about to fix that. And that's what season three is all about. And if you're taking notes, the big idea of season three is that as we follow Jesus, as he is developing that unshakable joy, he empowers us to make a difference. That God's plan for the world is us. It's for you, it is for your neighbor. Look at your neighbor and say, he's talking about you. God's plan for where you work, God's plan for your family, God's plan for that person that you see every day when you go to the grocery store, whatever, God's plan is you. And he doesn't wanna wait until you're finished, but right now, even in the season of life you're in right now, God has empowered you to make a difference. And that's what season three is all about. And so we, we've learned over the past several weeks how you know, Jesus sends us into our world and that there's gonna be opposition, but at the same time, there's gonna be great joy. And he spends this whole time trying to change how we think so that we don't see the world as an accident waiting to happen, but as, but as an adventure over each new horizon. That constantly seeing the world as an opportunity to make a difference. And he's been teaching us that. And now as he's finished teaching, he's going back into those harvest fields that he's been talking about. And he is going to start experiencing some opposition. Because as he is doing this and he's teaching about the kingdom, there's these other people called the Pharisees and different ones that don't agree with what he's saying. And so we're going to see how he interacts with them, the people who think they know God but don't really, and see how he tries to speak life to them and see what it will teach all of us. And so if you've got your Bibles ready with me, we're going to jump in and read this and then see what God's word would have to say to us. So first of all, God's word says, at about that time, Jesus was walking through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, so they began breaking off some heads of grain and eating them. But some of the Pharisees saw them do this and protested, look, your disciples are breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath. How could you? How could you do such a thing? But Jesus said to them, wait a minute. Haven't you read in the scriptures, which by the way, this would have been a little bit of a diss for them because Pharisees had to memorize like two thirds of the Old, the Old Testament, okay? So he's like, wait a minute. I thought you knew what you were talking about. <laughs> Haven't you read in the scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God and he and his companions broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that were only allowed for the priests to eat. And then haven't you read in the law of Moses that the priests on duty in the temple may work on the Sabbath? I tell you that there is one who is here that is even greater than the temple, but you would not have condemned my innocent disciples if you knew the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy not offer sacrifices. For the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Then he went over to their synagogue where he noticed a man with a deformed hand. The Pharisees asked Jesus, does the law permit a person to work by uh, providing a healing on the Sabbath? They were hoping that he would say yes so they could bring charges against him. But he answered them, if you had a sheep that fell into a well on the Sabbath, wouldn't you pull it out? Of course you would. How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Yes, the law permits a person to do good on the Sabbath. And then he said to the man, hold out your hand. And so the man held out his hand and it was restored just like the other one. Then the Pharisees called a meeting to plot on how to kill him. Thank you, Jesus, for healing somebody. 
now you're going to die. I mean, that is an amazing life-giving way to look at that, right? But here's the big idea of what's going on in this is that you have these people who claim to know God, yet when it comes to what matters most, they're getting it completely wrong. And what Jesus is trying to teach them is he's trying to teach them how to love God because they must have loved God to do what they were doing, but then how to also see God and how to know him because apparently they just missed the whole point. And if you're taking notes, the big idea of this is that as we follow Jesus, he restores our joy as we truly discover his word. That he restores our joy as we discover, truly discover his word. There's this big idea that's going on here because you really start to see the division between those who claim to know God and they're trying to get to God in a certain way. And then on the other side, you got those who are with Jesus. And there's this major divide that starts to occur. And it's not just in you know, the, the New Testament, but even now we're gonna talk about how this kind of occurs, but how Jesus kind of cuts through this. And of all the different ways he could have tried to show them what the kingdom of God looked like and the joy that was there, he uses his word to do it. So let's, let's break this up and see what God's word would say to us today. And that is, you see how he said it about that time. Now, a little bit of time has passed between last week and this week in the text. And so likely the 12 disciples have now come back together again and they're all there together and they are just enjoying the Sabbath. Because it said that as they were, it was the Sabbath, and they're walking through the grain fields, the disciples were hungry. But some of the Pharisees saw them do this and protested. How could you? How could you break the Sabbath by snacking? <laughs> You're not supposed to snack on the Sabbath. To which you would think first that they were stealing. Like you were like taking, it, it almost, if you don't know what's going on, it's almost like you ever like went to the grocery store and you just want to test the grapes, <laughs> you know? You're, you're, you know, but, but one doesn't do it. You're not sure that could have been an, an anomaly. So you got to try another. And then two's, you know, two's not quite enough. Three, three's a company. So you got to go on there and you kind of go, that is actually not what they're doing. That in the Old Testament, it actually told like farmers and those to, to leave the edges and to leave the corners for the widow, the orphan, you know, the, the destitute and those passing through. And so it was completely legal for them to do this. So literally, you think about what they're doing. They're going through the grain fields, and they would grab some of the grain. They'd rub the husk off of it and eat it. It took like five seconds to do that. And they're going, how could you? The world is going to come to an end because you're violating the Sabbath. And, and so like, what even is the Sabbath? Because it's a big deal. Like, it's one of the big 10 commandments that you're not supposed to violate, and that is the Sabbath. But here's the thing. It does say, do not violate the Sabbath, but keep it holy. But what was the Sabbath? Well, the Sabbath was a day of rest. It was a time of fellowship with God. It was intended to be a joy and a peace, a time to recharge. It wasn't just a day off. It was a day to recharge yourself. It was a day when God shows his ability to work while you rest. And think about the context of this. And that is that this was given to the Israelites right after coming out of slavery. So these, these are people that didn't get to call their own shots. They had to work for somebody else and they had to work seven days a week continually. And the, one of the first things that God said is I wanna teach you how to rest. You're good at work. Now let me teach you how to fellowship with me. And he even said, I wanna show you that on the day that you rest, I'll not let any enemies attack you. I'll not let anything bad happen to you. I'll make sure your harvest continues to grow. He's like, I want to show you that I'm trustworthy. So one day out of seven, just be at peace, rest, fellowship, spend time with your family, and recharge. It's beautiful, especially when you think of it in the context of who he was talking about. And all he said was, don't work. That's it. But then what happened though, especially after the exile, because after the exile, what happened was is, is these enemy nations came in and took over Israel. And when they finally got to come back after 70 years, they said, we don't ever want to do something to make God mad anymore. So we're going to do everything we can. And so what they did was, is they created these oral traditions called the Talmud and the Mishnah and all these different things where they added to God's word to say, well, if this is good, this is even better. And so they created all these extra things to keep away from violating God's word. And so it really became a bondage and it became the most difficult day of the week. What was supposed to be beautiful was the day that they didn't look forward to because they had so many things that God never said to do but it was intended to keep them from violating the Sabbath. Let me give you some examples of some of the stuff they couldn't do. This is for real, okay? They, they could not spit on the ground because if they spit on the ground, it might create like a, like a, a furrow and it looked like plowing. So they couldn't create a, a, a space in there. That, that's literally one of the things. They could not carry a coat because that was considered work and labor. 
So if you needed to take a coat from the bedroom to the closet, you had to put on the coat, walk into the closet, take the coat back off, hang it up, and go. You, they were so very afraid that they started adding stuff. How about this one? You couldn't braid your hair. Because first of all, it's confusing to a guy that doesn't know how to braid hair, but also it was considered work. Couldn't light a candle because you were creating work and you're supposed to be resting. You could not walk more than 300 feet at all. Like literally, if you walked more than that, you had to just sit down and wait for sunset because you didn't want to violate the Sabbath. All God said was, don't work. Spend time with your family, recharge. They added all this. And how about this one? You could not carry a needle for fear you might see a loose thread and want to sew it back together. That's actually in the Talmud to make sure that you don't violate the Sabbath. And so that's why last week Jesus said, come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Guess what? You can carry a needle if you need to, okay? Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And that's exactly though what had happened is they had created all of these things that had nothing to do. And that when they first did them, the idea was because we want to honor God. But at some point, some point they forgot about honoring God and it just became about legalism. And here's the reality of it is, is it kind of reminds me of like driving. And so uh, something happened to me not too long ago, and I don't know if this ever happened to you, but I, Autumn and I were going somewhere, and I was driving, and she was driving in a car behind me, and she calls me on the phone, and she says, are you okay? Yeah, man, I'm good. What's, what's going on? She said, you are swerving all over the road. Are you all right? I said, I'm still in my lane. She's like, oh, I know you're in your lane, but you're swerving over here to the left-hand side. You're swerving over there to the right-hand side. I was like, hey, how about you mind your business, all right? So I hung up the phone, you know, in Jesus' name. And then I couldn't wait until we were going somewhere again, and then she got to leave. And then I got to call and say, hey, you okay? You okay? Because she was swerving from the left and to the right. And I got to actually watching this, and you watch this today, okay? You watch this today, or let a police officer get behind you, then you'll just pay attention really closely right there. But you watch today, you're behind somebody, and you watch and see how they'll hug over to the yellow lane, and they'll hug over to the right lane, and this kind of thing. And they stay with, on the road, but they go back and forth. And they're just constantly swerving. Can I tell you that's the same thing that happens a lot of times in our relationship with God is that we, we will swerve from one way to the other. And we have to be careful that we don't because that's where trouble happens. Well, what are the edges that we have to be careful of? The first one is what we're going to call legalism. And that is that I must do the right things so I can be loved by God. That's what the Pharisees were dealing with. I got to get it right because if I, if I carry a needle... Or if I do this over here, or if I spit on the ground, I might offend the goodness of God, and then he won't receive me. And once again, I believe very much that when they first started this, it was all for the right reasons. But somewhere along the, the way, they forgot about their passion for God, and all they had left was empty religion. So that's the one side you got to be careful of. But there's another side you got to be careful of, and I made up a word. Okay, I heard this word, and I looked at it again, and it's called, we're going to call it slape agape, Okay. Now, if you don't know what agape is, that's the Greek word for love, okay? So, so sloppy love, but we're going to call it sloppy agape. And that is, it's not in your notes, by the way, but that's just anything goes. And that's, that's the people who say, God is love. And so therefore, whatever I love, God loves. And so I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, because God loves whatever I love. And so, yay, party. Well, here's the problem is that's also not true. Because God's word's got a lot of stuff in it that says avoid this and avoid that. So that, that can't be right either. And the, the problem is, is if you get on this side, you're going to get run over. If you get too far that way, you're going to fall off into a ditch. And so the middle of the road is what we're looking for, and that's the relationship. And relationship says, I get to do the right things because I am loved by God. The idea of the Sabbath was meant to be a gift. It's meant to be something that we enjoy. And there's so many things in the kingdom of God that we are meant to enjoy, that the joy of the Lord is our strength. But the problem is a lot of times is we don't tend to stay right in the middle. We tend to move over toward legalism and take all the life out of it. Or we go over to this other side and it creates selfishness and it creates self-centeredness. And we become our own God instead of God being God for us. And so what Jesus is trying to do is he's trying to help them understand how this works. And he's saying that you've been reading my word, but you've not got it yet. Like you, you have all the knowledge, but none of the relationship. And I wonder how many times in our lives, if you've ever struggled with the idea of legalism and trying to get it all right, that maybe we've read God's word, but we've never actually got the one who was giving us his word and to understand why, why there is life there. And so there's so many ways that we can work toward not swerving too far one way or the other, but the way Jesus chose to teach these Pharisees is through understanding 
his word. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the three things that Jesus said where he was like, did you not read? Have you not understood? And we're going to see how our joy will grow when we discover how to read his word and discover how to understand the God who has given us his word. Because that's what Jesus was using as the antidote for this legalistic mentality that they had. And so here's the first one. If you're taking notes, the first thing Jesus told them is that the joy of our relationship grows as we discover the principles found in his word. As we read his word and discover the principles that are found in his word. When you write that down, look at somebody and say, joy is in the middle. I know that was terrible. Look at somebody and say, joy is in the middle. Joy is not on the left-hand side. Joy is not on the right-hand side. Joy is right in the middle. And that's what he's trying to teach them, that the relationship you're looking for is not found on the edges. It's found in the middle. He said it like this. He said, haven't you read in the scriptures what David did when his companions were hungry? How he went into the house of God and his companions broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that were only for the priest or only allowed for the priest to eat. And so what he's actually saying is he's talking about a story. And so much of the Old Testament is taught to us that we learn the principles of God's word through those stories. And what happened in the, in the moment was is that David had been anointed king. However, he wasn't king yet. Saul was king. And one day Saul decided it was time to kill David. Like it was over. He was done. He just, he was stop pretending I'm gonna kill you. All right. And so he had to escape quickly. And as he was escaping from Saul, he goes to the tabernacle. And when he gets there, he doesn't have any food. He doesn't have anything. He, he is in a bad way. And so he goes and he asks the priest, hey, do you have anything for myself and my friends? Because we got a long way to go. And we don't have anything. And he didn't tell him uh, why he was fleeing. He's like, I just need help. He was in a sincere crisis. Well, in the Old Testament, what the Bible said for them to do as an act of worship is every seven days, they would bake seven loaves of freshly baked bread. Come on, what would it be like if the house of God smelled like Hope Cafe every single Sunday? That's one reason why we have it is it smells like the presence of the Lord, bacon and fresh bread right there. And that's what they would do. And at the end of seven days, they would bake seven more fresh loaves and they would take the other ones and they would give it to the priest. Hey, just as a way to honor you for being here, the priests get to eat this. And so now they've got these seven loaves that are, that are seven days old, but they're still good. David's got a need, and now they have an opportunity. Do I give David what's technically for me, or do I keep it? Because technically the law says, I'm the one who gets to eat this. And so what had happened with the, the Pharisees is this legalistic mindset. What they did is they read this story looking just for rules to do. And so they said, starve to death. <laughs> Sorry, David. I mean, I know you're starving, but technically this is mine and I'm just going to keep this. So uh, good luck. Hope, hope it works out for you. That, that's what the legalism would say. The, the slape agape people would have said, give all things to everyone everywhere. Yay. You know, just throw it all out of there. That's, that's not it either. And what the, the relationship would say is it's always right to help someone in crisis. Like God gave you this. Now you have it. Someone needs it. It's okay to give it to them. And what Jesus was saying is, is you, you went to my word just looking for rules and regulations and all this stuff, and you missed the life that's there. And one of the reasons why people don't like God's word is they don't, all they see is rules and regulations. And yes, there are, there are there, things there that says, do this and don't do this. But there's also so much more that talks about life. And when we understand the principles of God's word, it breathes life back into us and we can see why God is doing this. Because once again, one of the number one ways that God teaches us his word in the Old Testament is through stories. I don't know about you, but have you ever been reading something in the New Testament and was like, man, that sounds good, but what does that look like with like flesh on it? Like, what does that look like in the context of somebody's life? Well, good news. There's 39 books in the Old Testament of everybody getting it wrong, <laughs> like a lot, all right? And so he's like, he, here is how you don't do this. Like for instance, some of the stories is like Joseph, like you can learn how God is in control. Joker got sold into slavery by his brothers. <laughs> and then while he is in slavery, he gets lied on and gets put in prison. But then God does something amazing and he ends up becoming the second uh, most important person in charge over Egypt. And then when they come to him one day and apologize, they go, you know, I don't even have to apologize because God has been in control of my life. That's amazing. David, God sees more than others do. When it was time to anoint a king, he was voted least likely to succeed by his own family. <laughs> they were like, no, you just stay out there and you work, but then God sees more than we do. Samson, be careful who cuts your hair, okay? 
That's the lesson of, the, of, of Samson. Don't let a lady named Delilah ever touch your hair, okay? Because bad things happen. Daniel, God can use you in bad places. Daniel was sent to a foreign land that he didn't want to be. He didn't want to do the job. He didn't know the language. He didn't know anything. And he became one of the most important people and one of the only people in recorded history to serve a king in three different dynasties. Definitely someone that we want to learn from and God can use you. Elijah, God will never leave you. He was in a situation where he thought he was the only person that still served God in the entire nation, only to find out that he wasn't and God was with him. Jonah, if you're running from God, stay out of the water <laughs> because you might get swallowed by a big fish. <laughs> Just always something in God's word that we can learn. And so the great news is, is that we have this, this idea that we're working through and that is that we're reading through God's word one chapter at a time. And so if you want to read God's word with us, you can text RLC Bible to 94,000. And we're about to go through the, the book of Romans. And the book of Romans is so amazing in that it teaches us how to see God in the light of the gospel. And we read one chapter at a time so we can learn these principles. Because Jesus is saying one of the ways that you fight against legalism and getting the idea of what I'm trying to do in your life wrong is to go into my word and to see what I'm trying to tell you. And one of the things it says in Romans 1 that we're going to read this week is that for ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. And what that says is that saying that, that God is constantly trying to show himself to you. And what would it look like if you read God's word, not just as a, as a rule book, looking for do's and don'ts and looking for legalism, but what if you saw it as the heavenly father holding you by the hand and teaching you through stories and through different ideas and showing you how to make it through this world? To read God's word as our heavenly father mentoring you and trying to show himself to you throughout everyday life, I think it would help us to not get into a legalistic mindset, but to connect to the relationship that God wants for us as we discover his word because God's word reveals real life application. God's word is not just a history book, but it's intended to show us how to live in our life. Because here's the thing, names and places change, but people really don't. And so if it's true then, it's still true now. And if God can do something in people's lives then, he can do it now. And that's what Jesus was trying to tell the Pharisees. It's like, man, I created this day to be something beautiful and something wonderful. And, and out of the best of intentions, you've turned it into to bondage and heaviness because you forgot about the relationship aspect. And so he's trying to bring them back to relationship and said, man, you need to go back to my word and you need to read it as me trying to walk with you, not me trying to push you down in those areas. And so the first thing is, is that we understand the principles. The second one is, is he teaches us that our joy of our relationship grows as we discover the context of his word, the context of what it is he's trying to tell us. Look at somebody and say, the joy is in the middle. The joy is in the middle. It's not over here on the legalism side. It's not over here on the, what we're going to call the sloppy agape side, but it's right there in the middle. Because on one end, the legalism side, he's saying, now listen, you, you need to understand the principles of what I'm, I'm trying to teach you. And, but then on the other side, I got to push you off of the, the, the sloppy agape side, because if you're not careful, you don't understand the context. You don't understand that there are things that you're supposed to do. He said it like this. He's like, not only are we looking at David, but haven't you read in the law of Moses that the priests on duty in the temple may work on the Sabbath. I tell you, there is one who is even, or who is here that is even greater than the temple. So what he's saying is, is that yes, there's, there's application points here and there's principles, but you've also got to understand that in the context, there are things I want you to do. Because what he's saying is, is like there, there are people who are resting on the Sabbath day, but there are also people who are working. So in the right context that yes, I've got yeses and I've got noes. There's potholes I want you to stay away from. And there's, there's things over here I want you to not get into because I know where those things lead. And so in the context, realize that there are things that I'm going to tell you to do and not tell you to do, but it's always for your benefit. And so what we have to realize when we're reading God's word is to realize that context is king. Because if we're not careful, if we just make everything just, just a story, then we forget that there are things we have to do. So we read things in context. That's why you never want to read one scripture. You always want to read a passage of scripture. Because if you read one and you take it out of context, you might not get what God is trying to teach you. 
Like for instance, I don't know if you, I think I've told this story here before, but I heard this story of a guy who he said he was desperately looking for God to speak to him. He's like, man, I really need God to speak to me. I need some direction in my life. God, I need you to tell me what to do. And I know you're going to speak to me. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my Bible and I'm just going to flop it open. And I'm not going to look, I'm just going to point. And wherever I point, that's your word for me. And so he was like getting ready. And he's just like, okay, okay, Jesus. Jesus. Almost like he's rolling dice. Come on, Jesus. You know, he's getting ready. All right, here we go. Here we go. And he just flopped it open and he pointed. And the story goes, he looked and he said, and then Judas went out and hung himself. No, 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 no. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And go and point. He looked and he was, go and do ye likewise. Jesus, come on. No, no, no. That's the problem. That's the reason why we have to be so careful to read things in context because the reason why Judas was doing that was for a very different reason than this guy just wanting to have his, you know, an answer to prayer. Let me show it to you and what we're going to read this week. This week, we're going to read uh, Romans chapter three. And if you read something out of context, you lose what God is trying to say. For instance, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Now, if you are from the legalist area, you love that verse. Man, everyone's going to die and go to hell. That's how we say it. You got to put, you got to put an extra syllable if you're really angry, okay? And you're super holy. You got to, everyone's going to die and go to hell without Jesus. All right, look at your neighbor and say, hell, okay? No, I'm not saying that. Okay, I got you. Okay, we're talking about the location. It's fine. It's fine. Okay. All right. He's like, so that's the thing. Here's the problem. So the legalist person reads that and goes, well, praise the Lord. Uh, judgment, judgment, judgment everywhere. Well, then if you just read one other verse, you still don't get it quite, late, quite right because it's yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. Well, yeah, if you're all into the sloppy agape part, you're like, yeah, see, it's just free, free, free. You know, it's like, no, no, no. Keep reading because the whole thing is beautiful. And the whole thing says we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. For this is, the, this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. That is beautiful. That we can build our life on. And that's why you understand the context, what Jesus is trying to tell them. You, you miss the principles of what I'm trying to tell you, and you miss the context of what I'm trying to tell you. And so you miss the beauty of a relationship that is found when we do the things of God, but we do it for the right reasons. Because legalism says, I do the right things so that God will love me. A relationship says, yes, I do the right things, but it's because that God loves me. And so what I love about God's word is that it teaches us that God's word reveals more than we realize. Do you know most of the time when I talk to people who are struggling with God's word, it's because they either haven't read his word or they read it out of context. Can I tell you that I've learned that the hard way. When someone's struggling with the, with the scripture, I say, let's go to that verse. And we read a few verses above, a few verses below, and they go, oh, well, now I get it. And I wonder how many people struggle in their relationship with God because they, they're, they're, they're trying to serve a God that is not the God of the Bible. It is, it is a God they've learned about on social media or God they've learned about about somebody else instead of reading God's word because it's in God's word that he wants to reveal himself to us. And so what he's looking at these Pharisees and he's saying, man, what I want for you is something beautiful and something amazing, but intentionally or unintentionally, you've made it hard and you've made it difficult and you've made it full of bondage. And so what I want to do is I want to take you back to what I always intended, which is to be a place of rest. And that is to understand the context of what I'm trying to say, that yes, there are rules and there are things I want you to stay away from, but also the principles. And in that you truly discover God's word. You truly discover life. And the whole reason for it is this last one. And that is because when we do these things, we discover the heart of God through his word. The reason why we understand the principles of God's word. The reason why we understand the context of God's word is because the reason why God has caused 66 books of the Bible to be divinely inspired, the inerrant word of God, is so that we may know him, so that he can reveal his heart to us. Because he said it like this. He said, but you would not have condemned my innocent disciples if you knew the meaning of the scripture, I want you to show mercy, not just offer sacrifices. For the Son of Man is Lord, even over the Sabbath. In other words, the Son of Man is the one who can show you what this is all supposed to be about. And the thing is, is that they had gotten to a place in the nation of Israel's history 
Or what they would do is, is they would just do whatever they wanted to do and go, ah, well, I'll just offer a sacrifice and it'll be okay. I'll just keep doing what I want to do, offer a sacrifice, keep doing what I want to do, offer a sacrifice. And what Jesus is saying is that was not why the sacrifices were there. And so a legalism person, they love sacrifices because now they have a rule to follow. Like if I do the thing, I pay the penalty, keep moving. And he's like, that, that, that wasn't the point of the sacrifices. The slappe agape people are like, no sacrifices ever. Yay, just blind mercy. It's like, no, you missed the point. The point of it was, is we're to grow into maturity. He's like, the sacrifices were there in case you sinned. But when you come to me, I wanna free you from the law of sin and death, not so that you can sin without worry, but so that you don't have to sin anymore. That I wanna grow you toward freedom because most sin is just medicating broken places anyway. And what Jesus is saying is, is I wanna heal you of those broken places so that you're not having to depend on all those addictions and broken places and all those different things. So the whole goal of sacrifices was to give you a place so that if you, if you walked away from me, you could find your way back. But the hope was is that you didn't have to have it, but that you were able to continue to walk toward me every single day. And what Jesus is saying is, is that you would not have condemned my disciples if you understood that the goal of what they're doing is they're with me. That's the point. Is it there with me? And you should join me too. And the reason why I love that is because when you start to understand that God is sovereign, and so he is with you. And so even when bad things happen, he is still with you. You start to see the whole world differently because that's the goal of what he's trying to do. Like for instance, this week, we're gonna read Romans chapter five and it says this. It says, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. Why? Because if you think about it from a legalistic point of view, you think, well, you know, the reason why I'm running into problems and trials of every kind is I must've done something wrong or somebody else did something wrong and somebody did something wrong and we better figure it out because I'm, I'm dealing with some problems and trials around here, you know, and, and one plus one is two. And since I do everything right, then God is obligated to do right by me. And so it just gets, it just gets confusing. If you're in the slappe agape side, you go, well, I'm not supposed to run into problems and trials. So is God not faithful? I mean, is, it, is, that, is that the thing? Both of those will leave you getting hit by a car or over in a ditch. But if you understand the relationship attached to it, you understand that God is sovereign and God is with you, then what you can say is, we rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. Why? For we know that they help us develop endurance and endurance develops strength of character and the character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment because we know how dearly God loves us. Because he has given us his Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. You get to such a place where your relationship with God that I do the right things because God loves me that I realize that even when bad things happen, it has nothing to do with God's love. That as a matter of fact, that it's God is, loves me so much that he's even able to take these bad things and use them for my good because that's how good God is. Legalism says I must have done something wrong. Slape agape over here says God must have done something wrong. But right here in relationship is I trust the Lord that even when bad things happen, it has nothing to do with the goodness of my amazing God. Look at somebody and say, Jesus loves you. The reason why you can trust him even in the darkest valley is because Jesus loves you. And the amazing thing about God's word is that God's word reveals his goodness. God's word reveals that even when the worst thing happens, Psalm 23, though I walk through the valley of the very shadow of death, I will not be afraid. Why? Because I have learned through the principles of God's word, because I watched him walk with Elijah. I watched him walk with Daniel. I watched him walk with David. I watched him walk with all these other people. And so I know that he's never going to let me go. And then as I look at the context of his scripture and he's telling me which way to walk and what to do, that I have confidence and faith that even in the darkest valley, I can still have joy because I know that he's gonna be with me. And the whole point of this is Jesus is trying to change our mentality so that we don't see the world as, as an accident waiting to happen, but as an adventure over every horizon because our good God is with us. And it causes us to see everything different because that's what happens in this last scripture. After he's finished telling these Pharisees, and he's trying to tell them, guys, I need you to see this. I need you to come back to the simplicity of, of what God was always trying to do. You gotta come back to this because I've got all these good things. Then you can see the difference between living in the relationship of God and, and just hopelessly living in legalism about what happens next. The Bible said that then Jesus went over to their synagogue 
and where he noticed a man with a deformed hand. Now, a synagogue is a Jewish church. So he went to church. And while he was at church, he saw a man who had a deformed hand. Now, another one of those, those rules that wasn't in the Old Testament, but it was in the, the Talmud, said that you weren't allowed to provide medical assistance to someone on the Sabbath because that was considered work. The only time you could help them at all is if they were at the point of death. Then you could put a Band-Aid on it and hope they made it to Sunday. And then you would do that. So, so th this guy, no matter what was going on in his life, if he had this for a while or if it just happened, he wasn't at the point of death. So he's sitting in church hurting. And look at what happens. The Pharisees looked at this guy and they saw an opportunity. And they said, does the law permit a person to work by healing on the Sabbath? They didn't even see this man as someone hurting and in need. Even if they didn't believe in Jesus, they knew he could do miracles. Hey, Joe, here's an opportunity. The guy who can do healings, he's here. They didn't see that. They immediately saw a way to exploit this guy in order to get at Jesus. That's the danger of not being in relationship with Jesus. The most unhappy people I know are legalistic Christians because they don't know the relationship. All they know is the rules. And so they struggle to know. But what, look what Jesus saw. Jesus saw this man and he looked at them and he said, if you had a sheep that fell into a well on the Sabbath, wouldn't you work to pull it out? Of course you would. How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Yes, the law permits a person to do good on the Sabbath. And then he said to him, hold out your hand. And so the man held out his hand and it was restored just like the other one. And then the Pharisees called a meeting so they could plot how they could kill Jesus. The Greek word for kill there is actually a, a more intense word. It doesn't just mean kill, it means to destroy. They don't wanna just kill him, they wanna discredit him because they couldn't see past the legalism. And here's the danger of that. The whole reason why Jesus did all of this is because of this big idea he has for us and that is that legalism distorts us from seeing people. Jesus wants to empower us to truly see people. That's the danger. And as we walk through our life, one of the saddest things to me ever is that we think that, the, that God doesn't have a plan for our life. And then the thing that's almost just as sad to think that the plan that God has for us is only for us. But to realize that God has a plan for us and it's for us and for everybody around us. But sometimes what the enemy will, would love to do is if he can't make you bad, he'll just make you busy. If he can't do bad things, he'll just get you distracted. And one of the things the enemy will do is he'll take the goodness that you have for God and he'll start just kind of encouraging you to add more layers and add more layers. Well, if this is good, this must be better. And if this is better, this must be best. And before you know it, you've got all the rules going on and you're so far away from the goodness and the peace of God that you don't even like being a Christian anymore. Because as Jesus said, it becomes weary and it becomes heavy, and you don't even know why you do what you do. Then on the other side, you decide you're not gonna go there. And so then you get way over here on the other side. And it, if you're not careful, it becomes selfish, self-centered. You become your own idol, and you just get confused. And what Jesus is trying to say is, is I wanna keep you in the middle, because joy is in the middle. I wanna keep you from legalism. I wanna keep you from this slope agape over here because right here in the center is where I need you because if I can keep you in the center, then you're not always focused on yourself, but you can see hurting people all around you. How many people are hurting all around us? I can say this because I spent most of my life in a legalistic environment where we, ne we never sinned because we were worried about stuff way away from sin, you know? You know we, didn't, we didn't do anything. You know, we, didn't, we didn't go to dances for fear that we might dance, you know? We didn't go watch movies in a theater because that's where, that's where sin must happen. So we didn't, we didn't do anything. So sin wasn't a problem. It was, every, it was everything way before that. And that, that sounds good, but it becomes weary and it becomes heavy until it's not about loving Jesus anymore. It's about fear. And then I got out of that environment and I went way over here and developed some wounds, developed some addictions, developed some broken places. 
Because I forgot that God does tell me to stay away from some of these areas because he knows where they lead to. And so then I said, well, well if, if I'm not supposed to be legalistic and if I'm not supposed to be, you know, just out here, where am I supposed to be? Right in the middle? In a relationship with God? To realize I do the right things because I am so very loved by the Lord? Because he wants to show himself to me? And I want to tell you, if you're in here, you've been a Christian for a while, but man, you just feel like just, it's just not fun being a Christian. It's hard. It's heavy. I tell you, maybe, maybe it's because you found one way or the other. And what Jesus wants to do is he wants to call you back to that true joy of a relationship with him. And so if you're in here and you would admit, I struggle with that legalism, maybe because of the way you were raised or because of something else. Can I tell you the truth? And that is this, Jesus loves you because you're his. His. And he is interested in progress, not perfection. The goal is to continue to grow in him. And he is only interested in revealing what he also has the power to heal. And so when you're ready to take those steps, he'll do that. And so you grow closer to him every day, but to allow him to be the joy of your life, not always doing all the right things, but the joy of your life. But now if you're on the other side, can I tell you that there are things in God's word that's intended to keep you free. And so we do the things, not so that God will love us, but because God loves us. And so for the slape agape people, I would say, is what you're living for worth Christ dying for? Is what you're living for worth Christ dying for? And it pulls you back toward the middle because Jesus is interested in relationship. Jesus wants your walk with him to be the joy of your life. That you're, everything else can be going wrong. You can be disappointed by everything else, but you're never discouraged because I know Jesus, because I walk with him. And so in the good days, I celebrate him. In the bad days, I celebrate his faithfulness. And I'm constantly trying to stay in the middle of the road because it's in relationship that I realize that I do the right things, but it's because I am so very loved by him. And and I don't know where you may be in a message like this. Maybe you're a brand new Christian and all this is brand new to you. Can I tell you? Then this is a cautionary tale. Don't let don't let rules and regulations that God did never put in his word stop you from getting to him. Don't don't let anything over here on this other side stop you from muddying up the power and the purity of the gospel. But maybe you are in here and you struggle with legalism. Can I tell you that Jesus loves you, not the perfection of what you do. And so in just a moment, as the band leads us in a song of worship, maybe you just need to pray, God, can you bring me back to that center, the joy of knowing you, the joy of a relationship with you, to know that I am loved by you. Maybe you're in here and you're on the other side and you just have always been taught. It doesn't matter. I can do whatever I want to do. God loves me. Can I tell you, Jesus died on the cross for you, not so that you could sin without guilt, but so that you didn't have to sin and you could live in freedom every day. And so maybe your prayer needs to be, God, I'm so sorry for taking the cross and treating it so loosely. The reason why I live for God is out of a sense of honor and awe because his sacrifice was worth something. And so I live for him in his presence out of gratitude. And then maybe you're in here and it's because of these two things right here that you don't have a relationship with God. Maybe there was a time in your life when you walked with God and you had a relationship with him, but you saw a whole lot of legalistic people doing a whole lot of stuff that wasn't even close to God's word. And so you walked away from him. Or maybe you saw people who were in that slape agape crowd. You're like, it's gotta be more than that. I mean, people give their lives for this. It's gotta be more than that. Can I tell you, there is more than that. Can I tell you that Jesus loves you? He's never loved you more than he does right now. He's not mad at you. He is for you and not against you. He wants you to experience the joy of his presence, relationship, like you can't even imagine. It's one thing to know about the love of God, another to know him for yourself. Don't let another Christian have the power over your relationship with God, but instead come to him. And in just a moment, when the band leads us in a song of worship, inside your worship, God has a connect card. And on the back of it, it teaches you about what salvation is. It teaches you what it is to know Jesus as your savior and your Lord. And you give everything over to him. And so as we get ready to pray, maybe that needs to be your next step. 
is you need to just find a place. If you want to come up here up front, just kind of quiet place at the altar just to pray. Or maybe you want to go and ask some more questions about what salvation is. And there's a prayer team in the back that would love to answer your questions and pray with you. If you don't want to pray this by yourself, they'd love to pray with you. But whatever it is, don't let what somebody else did stop you from getting to the Lord. Because you've never been more loved than you are right now. And He's for you more than you can imagine. Let's pray together this morning. God, thank you so much for your goodness and for your mercy. Thank you, God, that you see us and you know us. Thank you, God, that you are with us and you are for us in this place. And God, I don't, I don't know exactly how everybody is going to respond to this message. Maybe, maybe there are people like me who struggled for so long with thinking it's got to be easier than this. That we try to do all the right things for all the right reasons, but at some point we, we lost the relationship. I pray, God, as we worship you, I pray that your presence will fill us. And Lord, you'll remind us we've never been more loved than we are right now. And Lord, we'll take a step toward your grace. Well, for others in here, that God, you're calling them higher. You're calling them further. You're calling them, Lord, to make you the Lord of their life. They've received your mercy. Now it's time for them to receive your kingship. I pray, God, that they'll go all in with you today and realize that, yes, it is by grace we are saved, by faith alone. But faith should not stay alone. We should work out that salvation by walking closer with you every day. And for those in here, God, that don't know you, I'm so thankful that your salvation is for us all, that you have invited all to your table. And that God, as we worship you in this moment, Holy Spirit, you will speak to everyone what they need to do. For some to let go of some things, for some to grab onto some things, and for some to give their life over to you. Thank you for your love. We celebrate you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me all over the house this morning? I'm going to give you an opportunity to worship the Lord. As I said, if you want to, if you want to find a quiet place up here just to spend time with the Lord, you're more than welcome. We have a prayer team. If you have more questions about salvation or would want to then pray with you about something else, that's what they're there for. But you have this moment. Let's not waste it, but let's give it to the Lord and allow Him to have His way in our life.